So um, when a solute dissolves in a solvent, it's actually an equilibrium process that is similar to that of evaporation. We've got two processes happening. We've got dissolving and we've got recrystallizing. So as the concentration of the dissolved solute increases, the rate of crystallization will increase. Initially, there's only dissolving because there's nothing in, there's nothing dissolved to recrystallize. And so we get a dynamic equilibrium set up. Um, here we're looking at sodium chloride dissolving in water. Solid sodium chloride can dissolve into sodium and chloride ions, but then the sodium and chloride ions can also recrystallize to form sodium chloride. And so in a dynamic equilibrium, the rates of these are equal. And that's what we see in a saturated solution. So illustrated pictures. Initially we have our chunk of sodium chloride and there's no sodium or chloride ions present in the solution and so they can't recrystallize. No recrystallization can happen. So all that can happen is this can begin to dissolve. As this dissolves and we get sodium and chloride ions in the solution, they can run into each other and recrystallize. And so we've got dissolving happening and a little bit of recrystallizing happening. The recrystallization is going to depend on the concentration of sodium and chloride ions in the solution. The higher that concentration, the faster the recrystallizing. So the dissolving will continue, the recrystallization rate will increase until these are equal to each other. And then you have sodium chloride dissolving and recrystallizing at the same time. Um, this will only happen in a saturated solution where you have some solid present. Um, when I pulled this flask out um, earlier when it was cold, it was um, mostly solid with a little bit of water, right, of, of liquid. And so that solid was in equilibrium with the solution and it's recrystallizing and dissolving and recrystallizing and dissolving. When recrystallization occurs, um, this happens in a more controlled manner. Uh, this is happening on its own. And so the sodium and the chloride ions are going to arrange themselves in more perfect crystal lattices because that's going to give them a lower energy. And they will tend to exclude other components. So you'll get a purer crystal. Um, Do you remember the copper lab that we did where we had a blue solution at the end and you added zinc to it and then you got this well kind of reddish copper stuff at the bottom what happens there when you're adding the zinc is we've got a redox reaction going and it's converting the copper ions into copper metal which then fall to the bottom but if that happens too quickly as the copper ions form, they can trap zinc atoms inside, and then you get an impure um, copper lump at the bottom. And that can happen when ionic crystals form as well. Water can get trapped in there, other um, ions that might be in solution. So the process of recrystallizing allows the crystal to dissolve and recrystallize over and over again, and you tend to get much better crystals. So um, a saturated solution is one that is full, like a sponge that's saturated with water, right? You can't put any more water in it. Put more water in it, it'll just run out. A saturated solution, the dissolved solute is in dynamic equilibrium with the solid. There is solid present in the solution. If you add more solute, it won't dissolve because the solution is saturated. In an unsaturated solution, we have less than the equilibrium amount of solute. All the solute has dissolved, and so if we put more in, it will continue to dissolve. So saturated and unsaturated are the two typical possibilities, and then there's supersaturated. The supersaturated solution contains more than the equilibrium amount of solute. It contains more solute than will dissolve at that temperature, which sounds impossible, right? It's unstable, and normally that excess 
will precipitate out. It's a little bit like that super cool sodium thiosulfate we had. We, you melted those crystals and then you cooled it down without disturbing it. And then when you stuck a crystal in it, we saw the temperature went up as it froze, right? Wait, what? And I said, it's like Red, Roadrunner or Bugs Bunny or somebody running off a cliff, right? They don't fall until they realize that they've run off the cliff. So a super saturated solution or a super cooled salt liquid is, hasn't been told that they ran off the cliff yet. And that's what I'm trying to have happen in this flask here. Um, this thing is, is off the cliff and we're gonna try to let it cool down without it finding out. It didn't work yesterday, I think because of that little black thing that was floating around in there, was telling the solution, hey dummy, you're supposed to precipitate, so it did. Um, so sodium acetate is one of a handful of compounds that will do this fairly easily. And this is a supersaturated solution of sodium acetate at room temperature. Looks like water. Disturb this and it will begin to crystallize. What happens is we need a place for the crystals to begin forming, a nucleation site. And so by touching the surface here with a glass stirring rod, that initiates the crystallization. And once a little tiny bit of crystal forms, the rest of it will form very quickly. And we see these crystals that grow throughout the solution. And it's really pretty amazing. And that crystallization will occur until you get back to a saturated solution. So I've got a couple of videos here to demonstrate this. And hope, you know, hopefully that demonstration in real life will work later, but if not, we at least have videos. spatula in there and you see the crystals growing from the tip of the spatula. Can I replay that? Sure. The crystals are forming. It's precipitating. And that's, this is real time. This is not sped up or anything. This is... Because the solution is super saturated. There's way more sodium acetate dissolved than can fit into the water at this temperature. And so as soon as it gets disturbed, all that excess precipitates out. Hmm? I stuck a spatula in it. Yeah, sometimes just thinking thoughts about it, disturb it, yeah. You know, some dust that fell in. I think that's why my experiment didn't work yesterday is because it looks like a little piece of the stopper. There's a little black thing floating in there. So that's like a spatula sitting in there just disturbing things, right? And then this one is people just playing. Whoops. Playing with sodium acetate. It's sometimes called hot ice. I stuck some toothpicks in there. And looks like they're growing cotton balls. The temperature there, 52 degrees. That's, that's warm. It's really warm. This originally is at room temperature, but as it crystallizes, it releases energy. It's exothermic, and so the solution warms up. 
Hmm? If you, it depends on how much water you have mixed in there. Here they've got the proportions just right so that when it, it crystallizes, it looks like it's a pure solid. It's actually wet though. It's kind of like a partially melted popsicle or ice cubes that have been in your soda for a while and you can chew on them. So here they're making uh, sodium acetate castles. And as it, as it hits the surface, that disturbs it and it precipitates. And it'll stay crystallized forever. So you put water in it or heat it up. Sort of the chemist version of dominoes. Not nearly as loud. So there she spelled the word ice, or tried to, with the solution. Any questions? Guy, we'd like to take a moment to say that. So I don't want to hear from you. Thanks, thanks very much. calculator covers that you left at an exam a while ago, if you want them back. Okay, so anybody wonder how can we make a supersaturated solution that has more than is possible, right? That, that just doesn't seem right. Well, we can make a solution like this because the solubility is temperature dependent. So for most solids, here what we've got is the solubility, the grams of solute that will dissolve in 100 grams of water as a function of temperature. And so say for lead nitrate here at 10 degrees Celsius, we can only dissolve or maybe 45 grams or so. But if we heat the temperature up to 60 degrees, now we can put 95 degrees, 95 grams will dissolve, so a lot more. So as you heat the solution, the solubility goes up. So we saw at room temperature, this solution was saturated. It was mostly solid and only a little bit of liquid. Then as I heated it up, the solid dissolved. It's still pretty toasty warm here. Um, so at a higher temperature, it will all dissolve. And now is the careful cooling off period don't anybody tell it that it's supposed to be crystallizing. There are some, some compounds like uh, cerium sulfate. Their solubility decreases as you heat them up. That's weird. So recrystallization can be used to purify a solid. Um, you make a saturated solution at an elevated temperature, you cool it down slowly, the crystals form slowly, and they tend to reject impurities and form more perfect crystals and more pure crystals. This is um, some rock candy, and rock candy is made by recrystallizing table sugar. You can try that at home, but be sure to look up a recipe, because if you don't get the proportions right, it's not gonna work. Gases can dissolve in liquids also. Solutions of gases in water are very common. Um, any carbonated beverage is a solution of carbon dioxide in water. Um, even our tap water um, has dissolved oxygen in it. So the effect of temperature on the solubility of gases in water is the opposite of that for most solids. The solubility for gases decreases with increasing temperature. As you heat the water up, the gas becomes less and less soluble. We can see this demonstrated by pouring um, some soda into cups. Here this is cold soda and this is warm soda. And the warm soda is going to fizz up really bad because the carbon dioxide is not as soluble here. The cold soda doesn't fizz up as much because the carbon dioxide is more soluble. You can also see the, the difference in how fast these go flat, they lose their carbonation. We could try this at home. Um, 
cup of soda on the counter, another cup of soda in the refrigerator, taste them tomorrow morning, right? The one on the counter is going to be noticeably flat, if not completely flat, and the one in the refrigerator is still going to have some fizz because at the colder temperature, the carbon dioxide is more soluble. This temperature uh, effect has a big effect on oxygen levels in our waterways. So aquatic life depends on oxygen that's dissolved in water. So fish, algae, all sorts of things, they get the air, they get oxygen from, from the water. And how much oxygen is in the water depends on the temperature. So there's something called uh, thermal pollution. So say you have a, a manufacturing plant and they're generating a lot of hot wastewater. And that wastewater may be perfectly clean, great water. It might even be you know, drinkable water, but it's hot and they're dumping it into a river. Well, what does that do to the temperature of the river in that area? It increases the temperature, which makes the oxygen levels go down and can cause the fish and other things to die because they're literally asphyxiating. They can't get enough oxygen. Hmm? Yeah, right? And there are cold water fish and warm water or tropical fish. And um, cold water fish are accustomed to higher oxygen levels. So if you say take a, you know, a largemouth bass or something and try to keep it in a warm tropical fish aquarium, it's going to have a hard time getting enough oxygen. Yeah. There, there probably are fish that can adjust, yeah. But most fish um, are, are designed to, to, to be in one environment or another. And so I remember getting, you know, tropical, my mom had an aquarium, you get tropical fish and you bring them home and you can't just dump them into the aquarium because the temperature change can shock them. Um, but you also may have to make sure that the temperature of your aquarium is correct so that the oxygen levels are, are right. Yeah. Could you explain again what happens when So the solubility of oxygen in water is lower at a higher temperature. So at a high temperature, less oxygen is dissolved. At a cold temperature, more oxygen is dissolved. So if the water heats up, there's not as much oxygen. It's a little bit like going up to a really high mountain peak where the air's really thin and you're like, oh, I can't breathe, right? Yeah, so that's, that's how the fish feel. This effect of pressure, the effect of pressure on, a, on solubility, um, the pressure of a gas above the liquid affects the solubility of the gas in that liquid and that's why soda containers are pressurized. So any, any soda container is going to have a little bit of what looks like empty space at the top. You can see this better in like a two liter bottle. There's, there's some, it looks like air at the top, right? That's actually carbon dioxide under pressure. And when you open the can or you open that bottle, you hear that pssst, right? The pressure being released. As soon as that pressure is released, the carbon dioxide begins to bubble out of the solution. I really should bring a, a bottle of soda in here and demonstrate it. You just take a, like a bottle of Sprite or something with a, that you can see through, and you just open the lid, and all of a sudden bubbles start coming up, right? How do they pressurize it? That's a good question. I'm actually not exactly sure. Because you can either pressurize it with gas, or you can put per carbonic acid in the water and the carbonic acid decomposes into water and carbon dioxide so it forms carbon dioxide. So that's another way to do it. I don't know exactly, that's a great question. So here we have an illustration of a solution at equilibrium. So here we have water, it's got some dissolved carbon dioxide, and there's carbon dioxide above the solution. So there's an equilibrium here. We have carbon dioxide leaving the solution and carbon dioxide entering the solution, much like evaporation, right? 
the rate of carbon dioxide going into the solution is going to depend on the concentration or the pressure of carbon dioxide. So if we cut this volume in half, now the carbon dioxide molecules are much closer together, their pressure is higher, they're going to go into the water at a higher rate. The rate of uh, the, lost the word, the rate of the CO2 coming out of the water is going to stay the same, but because we've increased the rate going in, we've increased the concentration of CO2 in, in the water. And so this is how you could use um, CO2 pressure to carbonate soda. You can just put, the, put a, a pressurized layer above the liquid and the, the carbon dioxide will dissolve in the water. And so it will form a new equilibrium. There's a, a law that describes the relationship here. It's called Henry's Law. Gives the relationship between the solubility of a gas, which is typically expressed in moles per liter. Um, it's proportional to the partial pressure of the gas. This isn't the total pressure of the gas, it's the partial pressure of that gas. So you can't just increase the pressure of air and expect the water to become carbonated because there's very little carbon dioxide in air. And the, the proportionality constant is called Henry's Law Constant. Um, that's gonna vary depending on the solute, the solvent, and the temperature. We can look things up um, in a table. This is one you might need for homework problems. Um, Henry's Law Constants for several different gases in water at room temperature. And so these units typically are molarity per atmosphere. You multiply that by um, atmospheres and you get the solubility in molarity. So determine the solubility of oxygen in water at 25 degrees Celsius exposed to air at one atmosphere. Assume a partial pressure for oxygen of 0.21 atmospheres. So this problem's fairly straightforward. They're wanting the solubility of oxygen. So we're gonna use the Henry's Law constant for oxygen, and we need the partial pressure for oxygen. Well, they gave us the partial pressure. And so we need to look up Henry's Law constant for oxygen. And it is 1.3 times 10 to the minus three. Molarity per atmosphere multiplied by the partial pressure. Get out the calculator. Two point seven times ten to the minus four. Questions? Yes? It's the Henry's Law constant for oxygen at room temperature. Yeah, so this table shows the Henry's Law constants. And they'll be different at different temperatures and for different liquids. No, no, don't memorize Henry's Law constants. Any other questions? Check the answer here, 2.7 times 7 minus 4.